Hello and welcome to this edition of Political Capital, the show where Delhi meets the Lal Street. I'm Vivek Law. It's been 14 years since the Vajpayee government kicked off its attempt to bring in the game-changing new tax regime, GST. And it's been over four years since the first GST rollout deadline was missed. Prime Minister Narendra Modi has promised more collaboration with states in his governance model and Finance Minister Arun Jaitley has already held meetings with his counterparts in the states. However, Bloomberg TV India learns that a number of key hurdles remain before the much-touted goods and services tax could see the light of the day. These range from the financial concerns of the states to the political realities of each state and the long legislative process that remains to be undertaken. In other words, the markets and India Inc.'s expectation of a quick implementation of the GST may well be belied. Our team of reporters Tanvi Shukla, Anupriya Nair, Priyal Gulyani and Priyank Lakhia will take you through the obstacles that lie in the path of GST. We will also be joined by former Finance Secretary R.S. Gujral and Mandira Kala of PRS Legislative Research to understand how this process will be navigated in the coming months. But let me come first to Tanvi. Tanvi, you have the details on how states first want compensation related to the central sales tax to be dealt with before beginning any discussions on the GST. Take us through that. Indeed, Vivek, it's the unfortunate legacy that has been inherited from the previous government. Now, what's really happened in the last few years is that uh, starting 2009-2010, states were to be given compensation for the reduction in the central sales tax, which is reduced from 4% to 2% and was expected to be phased off, still is expected to be phased out once GST gets implemented. But uh, this compensation was never fully paid except in the first year. In the last couple of years, hardly any amount had been doled out by the central government. We are actually looking at a figure of 30,000 crore rupees that has to be paid from the central government to the states. Let's talk about some of the big ones. Tamil Nadu is one of the biggest with big bill of 7,000 crore rupees staring at them. The finance minister of Tamil Nadu has very clearly stated to uh, 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 Arun Jaitley that uh, they will want this compensation to be allocated in the upcoming budget itself before any conversation on GST even goes forward and they do want this compensation of revenue to be mandated as part of the GST going forward as well. Again, West Bengal has dues worth 3,006 crore rupees. Uh, so while they are favoring GST at this point of time, it is again coming in with riders saying that compensation for revenue loss due to CSE and other taxes being faded out has to be given by the central government. Uh, Naveen Patnaik was one of the first chief ministers who actually came and met uh, the finance minister after he was sworn in, uh, asking uh, uh, for the CST compensation. They are looking at a dues of 3,000 crores for the uh, last few years. Talk about some of the other states. Maharashtra has about 850 crore rupees due. Haryana has a very big heavy bill of 4,800 crore rupees. They have also very clearly stated in the meeting with the finance minister that this has to be first dealt with before the conversation on GST can go forward at any stand. Assam has an interesting stand. They have again brought up the issue of petroleum products being uh, uh, out of of the purview of GST and constitutionally mandating the revenue compensation. Uh, as far as Gujarat is concerned, of course, one of the states will, which will not uh, be expected to create any more hurdles. Same goes for Rajasthan that has given its uh, uh, go-ahead as far as GST is concerned. But there are a few more states with their bills. You've got Chhattisgarh with about 3,000 odd crores and Goa also looking for compensation. This chief minister was in town just last week and has demanded the compensation of about 300 crores. In all, Vivek, it comes to about 30,000 crores. It's a big bill that we are looking at. Mm. Anupriya, what are the political realities that the Modi government faces? The NDA is in power in just a handful of states. A majority of them are either controlled by the UPA or by regional parties. Take us through the country's political map and how that could become a hurdle for the GST rollout. 
that's the big question. What really happens from here on with the inter interstate and national uh, coordination? We heard Prime Minister Modi talk a lot about it, and here is why. If you look at the map, it looks very different from when we picked it up on May 16. The state-wise map, uh, when it comes to uh, ruling parties, looks very different. The saffron surge in merely eight states out of 29, making the NDA only a bit of the big of the bigger picture. Look at where the UPA is ruling. 11 out of the 29 states. In fact, uh, 10 of those states coming under others right now. Uh, the sole is coming in that there are some states that are up for grabs are coming in for elections. That's what one has to watch out for. Some of those elections are coming into Jammu and Kashmir as well as Delhi, as well as Maharashtra. So that could be the key for NDA to try and manifest on its poll euphoria that it saw earlier this year to grab some more states. But obviously, the center state coordination will remain a difficult point when it comes to GST for Prime Minister Modi. Priya, let me come to you now. Even if the political system moves towards some sort of consensus on GST, there is a very long and complex legislative process that will then have to be undertaken. And since there are issues that need constitutional and federal changes, it's not just the parliament in Delhi that this bill will have to be reviewed by. Well, there's a long distance that needs to be covered as far as the legislative process is concerned. Remember, it's a constitutional amendment. Uh, the constitutional 115 amendment bill that was placed earlier is lapsed now, and therefore it would mean that, the, that this bill comes in uh, back again but before it comes whether if at all there is tweaking or or uh, you know they, it remains as it is uh, that has to be considered following which there will be standing committee report that will need to be it will first have to go to the standing committee and a report to come in from there uh, once you know as far as the passing of this constitutional amendment is concerned there are certain stringent requirements uh, that is of two-third majority and many such other factors uh, only after that will the process of the other legislation in terms of uh, the enactment of the central law and also uh, various state legislation uh, state assemblies to pass this uh, is something that will have to take place uh, which also it's important to note that this uh, requires all states to be on board uh, Thereafter, will the process of, you know, setting up infrastructure or, uh, you know, deciding on the model rates or uh, the uh, entire GST structure will come into place. But to begin with, there is a distance that needs to be covered, as I pointed out. First, as far as bringing this entire bill, uh, the amendment, constitutional amendment bill, in, uh, you know, in, uh, into force in terms of, uh, you know, first going to the standing committee, seeing where the bill is, given that it is lapsed. So the whole process uh, needs to be uh, really uh, something that has to be revisited once again. Priyank, let me come to you now. Given all that remains to be done, are the stock markets being realistic? about how long it is going to take for GST to be implemented? Is the market willing to give the Modi government the time it needs to roll out GST? Wait, now clearly going by what we've been hearing right now, what we've been discussing in terms of the simple priorities and the outlook for the government, the market also is highlighting it in two aspects here. On one side, you've got the short-term or the near-term uh, outlook in terms of what the priority list looks like. On the other side, you have got the long-term uh, long list. The near-term priority clearly are inflation and fiscal consolidation that we've been reading across. Uh, the long-term focus is on various sectors like power, railroad, agri, urbanization and skill development. Now, th that's as far as what the market is reading of the priorities. Move that forward and talk about how they're actually going to go implement it. As Anu was just mentioning, regarding the hurdles itself, as far as the Rajya Sabha is concerned, is a critical point that the market also is working with. Taking that into account, the kind of conversations that we've been having on the channel and talking to a couple of the market experts as well, what I actually pick up here, Vivek, are a couple of the key highlights. What the market is actually working right now with is that most states are not on board when we talk about GST. It's only the BJP ruled states that seem to be in favor. They also say that the budget, which is expected in the next uh, couple of weeks' time, will only offer somewhat of a roadmap is for the GST itself. They aren't really expecting any kind of deadlines to actually be announced when we talk about the budget. Only a pure roadmap could come in here. And the fact here is they're also looking at a possible staggered rollout is what the market is working with when we talk about GST. And if, from a timeline standpoint, they're probably talking about second half of the fiscal of, of FY15 or even April 2015 is more of an optimistic view that the market is working with for the GST rollout.
Welcome back. You're watching Political Capital on Bloomberg TV India. We've been discussing how the much-touted goods and services tax reforms remain a long, drawn-out process that could still take many months, if not years, before it is completed. Joining me now on the phone line is R.S. Gujral, former finance secretary, who also headed the revenue department during his stint at the North Block. Also joining me to talk about all the legislative procedures involved for GSD is Mandira Kala, Head of Research at PRS Legislative Research. Thank you very much, uh, both of you, for joining me. Mr. Gujral, uh, there is, again, a lot of talk and expectations that GST could come soon. You've seen the process very closely. You've worked at it uh, when you were in government. Are we being over-optimistic, given the fact that it is a very complex piece of legislation? Uh, what is your own assessment? Vivek, uh, what has been mentioned already is that there are a large number of challenges. Uh, let me just go through a few of those challenges. First is, of course, the issue of state autonomy for taxation decisions. Second is financial loss to the states or the center, not just for the CST, but also when the final rate is decided. Third challenge is pertaining to the uniformity in the basic structure of the GST. Fourth is an issue of uh, dispute resolution. And fifth is ensuring an excellent computerized network in order to ensure smooth working of the GST. Now, the basic question being raised on your channel is, is it feasible? Are there uh, alternate solutions? Let me go through each of these points. First is the issue of the state autonomy. States are keen to have some flexibility regarding the rate that they would like to levy for their state GST. I think that is feasible. Uh, probably, while a uniform central GST rate may be fixed, a state GST could be within a particular band, say like 10 to 15 percent. The second issue is regarding financial loss. The first element which comes in in this, and I'm leaving aside the CST compensation, which is supposed to be uh, transitional in nature. The first major issue is what is the rate of GST that you would fix? My personal view is that 8 plus 8 is totally not feasible. The current rate for government of India is 12% plus uh, with the SEF, etc. It works out to about 12.35%. And for the state, the VAT hovers close to about 13%. And if you take the cascading effect, it works out to close to about 14 to 15%. Therefore, clearly the rate which is neutral to revenue overall, I don't think would be less than 10, to 10 plus 10, may even be 11 plus 11. Now, that is an aspect which needs to be looked into. So you can ensure that there is no loss. Keep a rate which is revenue neutral, which, of course, after an experience of a year or two, could even be modulated up or down and keep that flexible band for these states. Second is the issue regarding the production states, because many states which are currently production states have a fear that with GST, they would be losing. Now, this is an issue which has not been uh, discussed in great detail, but uh, perhaps what could even be thought of is that you keep a little bit of cascading still in your GST, keep a minor element of CST, say even 1%, so as to protect the interests of the production stakes, and they don't feel that they are going to incur a loss. The third element is regarding uniformity. Clearly, for the basic structure, there have to be clear common rules for valuation, common rules for classification, common rules for input tax credits. The exemption limit need to be rationalized and brought to 
to a uniform level. Currently, the exemption limits vary from state to state for their VAT. For the center, the exemption limit is drastically lower for service tax and much higher for excise. There needs to be a rationalized and a combined decision uniformly for this exemption limit. You need to rationalize the SENVAT credit issues. There are a large number of issues still pending. You need to bring into tax net various items which are presently exempted. Then regarding the dispute resolution. So uh, the issues, uh, yeah, so if I can just interrupt you, you, you flagged off so many issues. Yeah. Uh, and these are all extremely pertinent issues which have not even been resolved yet. And we do yeah. know that even once all this is resolved, there is a legal uh, procedure. Would it be fair, therefore, uh, to presume, going by what you're saying, that we are nowhere close to actually seeing the implementation of this? I mean, it could be, uh, you know, months, even months could be, uh, you know, too short-term a target to look at. Vivek, uh, clearly after the uh, standing committee uh, recommendation, a view has to be taken by government of India. It can be taken after a meeting of the uh, empowered committee and brought in for parliamentary approval. But if you are saying that is it possible to do it in one month, I don't think that's feasible. It may take at least four to six months. But let me get back to your point that you are saying that should we then think that we should go ahead with it? Is it required? My straight answer is definitely yes. GST would definitely ease business tremendously. It would definitely boost manufacturing and make the Indian business globally competitive. And if you are asking whether it can be done by this government, my straight answer is yes. The Modi government has a very strong mandate. The question I'm asking you, sir, is... Yes, the question, sir, that I'm asking is how long could it take to be realistic? Uh, because there are a lot of unrealistic expectations. As you rightly said, you talk to any corporate, any, any, any businessman, he says, I would want it tomorrow. But the point is how long could it really take in a realistic manner, that was my question. I, I mean, I understand that this is an important piece of reform, very critical, but I'm just trying to get some sense from you in terms of the kind of timeline that is reasonable and realistic. Vivek, in my view, if the government shows the will to implement it, it could be done in six months to 12 months' time. But if you All expect right, that it may be Mandira done... Kala, let me come back to you. Uh, right, Mandira Kala, let me come to you now. Let's try and understand, uh, you know, we heard Mr. Gujral say that there are contentious issues. So let's presume that these contentious issues are first resolved and then start the clock ticking from the legislative point of view. Could you take us through what the procedure would entail? Uh, well, Vivek, uh, uh, the, in the President's speech to Parliament, uh, the government made it very clear that GST was one of the legislative proposals they were considering. Uh, if we were to assume that at the earliest in the forthcoming session in July, a bill would be introduced in Parliament, uh, there's a very, it's very difficult to predict how long it would take. And here's why. Um, once the bill is introduced, uh, it is going to be referred uh, some, a bill of this nature to a standing committee. Uh, typically, it would be the standing committee on finance. Uh, standing committees have not been uh, composed yet. Uh, and I have heard even uh, the speaker mentioning that for the budget, uh, which typically uh, goes to standing committees, the demands of grants, that process itself might not be done during July because standing committees would not have been constituted. Uh, Assuming when standing committees are constituted, perhaps in August, this bill will then make it to the committee, which will take its own process, uh, review, 
uh, invite uh, comments from stakeholders and ensure that uh, due diligence is done uh, in trying to understand the implications of the bill. In going by past record, typically uh, standing committees are allowed a time of three to six months to submit a report. But during the 15th Lok Sabha, uh, the GST bill was actually introduced in March 2011, if I'm not sure. Uh, and uh, it took the standing committee two and a half years. It was only in 2013 that uh, the committee actually submitted its recommendations on the bill. So we don't know, you know, there is past president means that it could go longer, it could be shorter, depending on the kind of consensus that has been built and the kind of emphasis and priority uh, that the standing committee would give. Uh, once the standing committee has given its report, uh, the government would have to uh, look at the recommendations that have been made, uh, probably go back to the cabinet, look at what amendments need to be made in order to reflect some of the standing committee's recommendations. And then the bill would be brought back for discussion in parliament. Um, and <clears throat> if passed in both houses, again, it's a constitutional amendment bill. It requires two thirds uh, majority. Uh, it would, uh, we'll have to see uh, how the parties are brought on board to be able to ensure that that happens. Uh, on another matter, I think um, uh, in, the, in the newly constituted parliament, there is definitely a majority of the government. Uh, but when we look at it in terms of opposition parties, uh, in uh, addition to the Congress, we have several regional parties. Uh, we have the BJD, we have the Trinamool, we have the AIDMK. So uh, it's really uncertain how these parties will actually uh, be brought on board, how consensus will be built uh, to allow the government to really push through the legislation uh, and uh, pass the enabling law, which is the Constitution Amendment Bill. This will have to be followed up with a regular simple law uh, on uh, being able to discuss the matters of, uh, you know, what will be the rate of GST, how will it be distributed between center and states. So we're looking at a possibly a longer horizon uh, than I would say six months. Uh, Mandira, what about the role of the states? Uh, do state assemblies uh, and both houses there have to clear this as well? Uh, how, how is the procedure there going to yes. be followed? And is it all states uh, or would it be a majority of states? What, what does the rule say on that? It, uh, the rule says that this bill would have to be passed by a simple majority, two thirds present and voting in both houses of parliament. And it's since it's making a, a change in the jurisdiction of what parliament and states can legislate on, it would also require ratification by 50% of the states. Only then would the law will be enacted. So definitely states have a great role in being able to allow this constitutional amendment bill to pass. Uh, you, you said 50% of the states, which means uh, it is not all states. That's right. and, and therefore, why I'm asking you this is not all uh, that it, 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 it's not going to be that one state can stand up and nix the whole thing. So 50% of the states, uh, so roughly we're talking 29 states, roughly 15 of them, if they are able to clear this, it goes through. That's right. All right, Mandira Kala, thank you very much for joining me here on Political Capital and sharing that important perspective. So here's what we need to factor in when assessing the GST timeline. Have all issues with the existing tax regime been sorted out with states? Can the center then address states' fears about loss of revenues under GST? Will states not align to the NDA come on board easily? How long will parliament and state assemblies take to pass the legislation? And finally, how much time does the country's administrative system need to be prepared to implement GST? Lots of questions which still need answers. That's all the time we have on this edition of Political Capital. Thanks for watching.